let me let me just start by saying the term LGBTQ plus and you know how matter how far you take that I know that letters keep getting added that represent different people groups is a very broad banner. Uh, it started off as LGBT, which was lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And then Q was put in there, which is queer or questioning. Then there was I for intersex. Uh, then I know that there is uh, two-spirit uh, that is that has been cor incorporated in. And, and so I think a lot of people just kind of have gone LGBTQ+. Plus, uh, but it's a really broad banner, and it represents a lot of ground, a lot of... Um, a lot of territory. Prior to probably 15 or 20 years ago, it was just, the, the conversation was around the, the subject of, uh, of gay or lesbian, so you, you were, uh, the, the issue of homosexuality, that was kind of the primary issue, and then other, other things got put into there. Um, transgenderism is a relatively new term. Prior to this, the clinical term for that was uh, gender dysphoria. It's an actual psychological uh, disorder that people wrestled with. And uh, just recently, it's not been very long, that was actually taken out of the American Psychological Association's handbook as a disorder. It was removed out of there as a disorder because it's now been placed as a category within what is now viewed broadly as a marginalized sexual uh, identity group. And so when we talk about LGBTQ, obviously the Bible, uh, God's word and God has a lot to say about sexuality because sex from the very beginning, sex is found in Genesis chapter one. First chapter of the Bible, God deals with the issue of sex. And he also deals with the issue of identity. He also deals with the subject of our bodies and marriage, and then sexuality and family as well. So all of these issues are, are not issues that we have developed. They're issues, they're subjects that God was not just uh, invested into, but they were God's idea as part of the created order from the very beginning. And what we see very quickly is in Genesis 3, two chapters later, when human beings who were created Perfect, were created good by God. Marriage was created good by God. Sex in the bonds of marriage was created good by God. It was then corrupted, just like everything else in creation was corrupted, when humanity believed the lie of the tempter, that God somehow was holding out on them, and that God somehow was was trying to trick them and steal from them. And so when we believed the lie of the tempter, the enemy, and we rejected God's truth and God's created order, that's when all bad things entered into the creation. And that's where we get the fall. You know, oftentimes in the church, we overemphasize the effects of the fall, but we forget to talk about from the very beginning, it was not so. In the very beginning, God created everything good. Human beings were good. Uh, human beings were, uh, were in relationship with him. Human beings had perfect relationships with each other. The Hebrew word for that is shalom. We, we use shalom to say peace, but it really means all things being in order as they're supposed to be. So God created everything within shalom. It was man's rejection of God's authority and God's word and his commandments that we actually brought brokenness into the world. It's where death came from. It's where divorce came from. It's where racism came from. That's where hatred of one another came from. That's where death came from. That's where sexual brokenness came from. And we are today living in a world that has been affected by sinful brokenness. And it's affected every part of creation, including sexuality. So when we deal with the subject of sexual brokenness, whether it's LGBTQ, plus, or whether it's heterosexuality, whether you're just like, well, I've never struggled with those things. I don't have same-sex attraction, or I don't struggle with feeling like I was born in the wrong body, that I really should be a male or a female, but even though my body tells me I'm something different, which is gender dysphoria. Those things, or whether you're just a straight person and you just struggle with, you know what, I wanna have sex outside of marriage and I wanna live a promiscuous lifestyle. All of those things, all of those manifestations 
are not the result of God creating us good. It's the result of us as God creating us good, but us being born into a sinful, broken world. It's why we need Jesus. It's why every single one of us need Jesus, because in Jesus alone, we become new creations. In Jesus alone, God's grace meets us, saves us, forgives us, transforms us, renews us, and there's hope for every single one of us. So if you're a heterosexual, you're somebody who's attracted to the opposite sex, but yet you have sexual brokenness in your life, I got good news for you. Jesus saves, Jesus delivers, and Jesus heals. And I've got good news for you if you are homosexual, if you have same-sex attraction. Jesus saves, Jesus delivers, and Jesus heals. And I've got good news for you if you feel out of place in your body and you've struggled with that. Jesus saves, Jesus delivers, and Jesus heals. This is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. None of us, fall, none of us uh, rise to the level of, of fixing ourselves. We all have sinned and we all have fallen short of the glory of God and we all need a savior. And this is why it's important for us as the church to do what Jesus did. How many know that Jesus is our model of life and ministry? What Jesus did, that's what we should do. In John chapter one, I think it's verse 16, says that Jesus came with grace and truth. This is how Jesus came. He came offering us all grace. I'm so, 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 so grateful for grace. God's mercy, where he gives me what I don't deserve. But Jesus also came with truth. And he didn't negate truth for grace, and he didn't negate grace for truth. He didn't come just pounding people with the law, but he also didn't let us off the hook. So the woman who's caught in the act of adultery, everybody wanted to stone her. Was she guilty? Yes. Has she violated God's law? Yes. Was she sexually broken? Yes. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, where are your accusers? I don't condemn you either. Go your way and sin no more. So he offers her grace, but he also acknowledged the truth. And this is, I think, the, the position, the stance that as Christians we have to have when it comes to the subject is we have to recognize the truth, like the truth says that all of us are broken, but yet we also have to walk in grace towards those. Uh, last thing I'll say about this is because even if we got somebody that we would classify LGBTQ+, plus, and we got them to modify their behavior and stop doing or thinking the way that they do, without Jesus, they're still lost. It's not the, be, it's not the change of behavior, try harder, be harder, do better, that actually makes you right with God. It's God's grace coming and meeting you and saving you and forgiving you and you choosing to follow Jesus. Amen? Okay, so I think I answered the question. I think you did, yeah. Uh, what? First service, as we were talking about this, you had said a phrase um, that this is probably one of the first times in our society that behavior has been linked to identity. Right. right. Um, and specifically with um, LGBTQ, where it's you can no longer target just the behavior because now you're targeting someone's. Well, identity. it's not just LGBTQ. It's even the fact that we're identifying ourselves as heterosexual. There's, it's not just the first time in our history, it's the first time in the history of the world that we can find any record of, and this isn't according to me, this is according to social scientists. There's never been a phenomena in any civilization where people's primary identity is defined by their sexual behavior. It's never existed before. Uh, it's a formation of social science, of psychology, where we've embraced that, where we have now identified that the, the most descriptive and most important marker of your identity within society is based on your sexual preferences. So the, even the idea of me saying that I'm heterosexual, now that's not my identity. My identity is I am a man, I am a child of God, I am a citizen of this country. That's my primary identity. And then historically, we had behavior. It was like, so I'm engaged in sex, or I'm engaged in same-sex uh, attraction, or I'm engaged in dressing like a, a person of the opposite sex that is a, a social, cultural construct. And, and I, put, I dress up and I begin to identify as the opposite sex. No other culture would, has ever come along and that's become your primary identity. And let me tell you why it's important for us to recognize that. It's because now within our culture, it wasn't like this, by the way, 50 years ago either. Now within our culture, 
if you have a difference of, a, of opinion or a difference in worldview with somebody's behavior, now because their behavior is their marker of identity, you're not just rejecting or differing on their behavior, you're actually speaking to their value as an individual. Do you see that? So if I had a friend, and I did in high school, one of my closest friends, who was a, a Christian, still is to this day, but he really wrestled with homosexuality. He, he would engage in it. He would go in long periods of time. He'd get in relationships. He was very promiscuous. He was older than I was. Uh, I was 15, 16. He was 19, 20. Probably my closest friend. He was going to be in our wedding until he bailed out the last minute. But he would love Jesus, but he really wrestled with us. And he would go and he would show up at my house on, on Monday morning. And he had just been out on a, on a bender and like, Go to the gay bar and, and pick up and get picked up and engage in that. He would come and he would, he would feel so guilty about what he just did. And so we, I would pray with him and walk with him. And he would go through seasons of victory. I think he's finally now walking in a lot of victory. But what's interesting is he, he did not identify himself by his behavior. But to this day, now the way things are, if somebody says, my identity is I'm gay, and I say to you that my worldview, which is centered on God's word, calls that sin, they don't just hear me saying, you're saying my behavior's wrong. They hear me saying that I'm wrong, that something's wrong with me. And this is why we have to have an understanding of God's created order. It's like, no, I'm not saying that you're wrong. Well, in fact, I am saying we're all wrong. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm wrong, you're wrong. We're, we're all wrong in the sight of God, but when the gospel meets us and we believe in the transforming work of the power of God and we repent of our behavior and we submit to God's truth, that's when transformation takes place in us. And it's, but that is a reason why we feel such a divide in the church between culture uh, where culture is at on this issue of identity and where the church and the Bible is at is because there's this pulling away of culture saying, no, you either accept us and affirm us, this is who we are, or uh, you're a bigot and, and we don't want to have, have anything to do with you. Listen, Jesus is an equal opportunity savior. He saves anybody and everybody, but he saves us on his terms, not ours. So that's what I'll say about that. Yeah.